All right. Welcome everybody to today's webinar hosted by the International Solar Energy Society ISIS and brought to you by the IEA HSC Solar Academy. We are very pleased to have all of you here and we are especially happy to welcome the IEA HSC Solar Academy. This is the second Solar Academy webinar ISIS is hosting this year and we are very much looking forward to many more exciting webinars to come. Today's webinar will present the solar heating and cooling market and industry trends for 2018 and the webinar will last one and a half hours and will of course include a Q&A section for you, the audience. My name is Arabella. I am the Communications and Outreach Officer here at the ISIS HQ in Freiburg, Germany and I will give you a short introduction into ISIS and the work we do as we have many new participants joining us today. The International Solar Energy Society ISIS is a non-profit UN accredited membership NGO. Our vision is 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, research, researchers, engineer practitioners, consultants, students, businesses and advocates. ISIS works together with like-minded organizations from countries all around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. There are many benefits to joining ISIS and you can find out more on our homepage. Some of the benefits are the exclusive access to presentations and webinar recordings such as today's in the ISIS webinar archive. ISIS members can also get discounts and even free registration to ISIS events and partner events. You can always find more information on upcoming conferences and discounts on our website or contact us at public.relations at ISIS.org. Every month ISIS publishes a newsletter for our members where you can follow our progress and share your news. Members can also subscribe to our, our academic journal Solar Energy, our flagship publication. And in the ISIS online bookshop, ISIS members qualify for reduced prices on the different publications. So we welcome those who are not yet members to join today to support our work. For those who are already a member, we thank you for your support. Now some brief information on the webinar and especially the Q&A session for you, the audience. During today's webinar, our expert speakers will give their presentation on solar heating and cooling market and industry trends. This will be followed by the Q&A session. For the Q&A session, we invite you to send in your questions and we are looking forward to your participation. When sending in the question, please write who the question is for and keep your question short and precise. Please feel free to start in sending your questions anytime throughout the webinar. I am now happy to introduce our moderator for today, Pedro Diaz. Pedro will introduce you to our speakers and guide us through the Q&A session. Pedro Diaz joined Solar Heat Europe, first as Operations Manager, later as Deputy Secretary General, and now as Secretary General, promoting the use of solar heat technology for renewable heating and cooling in Europe. With his degree in management, Pedro has an extensive experience working in the private, public, as well as non-governmental sector. Now, I'm happy to hand over to you, Pedro. Pedro, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Arabella. Thank you to everyone uh, joining us today. Um, I'm glad for this opportunity to cooperate with this uh, webinar as a moderator. So, you know, my name is Pedro Diaz. Uh, I represent Solarit Europe. Some of you might know it uh, as ESTIF, European Solar Thermal Industry Federation, which was our previous name. So we are a trade association representing the, the solar heating and cooling uh, sector in Europe. So I'm very happy to present this uh, webinar with uh, very interesting information about the, the solar thermal market uh, worldwide, um, in particular in, in a year where we are, um, again, uh, uh, let's say, uh, happy to show uh, growth in the, in the European market. Um, and that will be also, uh, I think, referred in, in the coming presentations. So we have uh, three outstanding speakers with us today. So Werner Weiss, uh, Thomas Amschak and, and Berbel Epp. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker that will start with an introduction about IASHC and its Solar Academy, and, and then proceed for his presentation uh, on the new edition, edition of the Solar Heat uh, Worldwide. So Werner Weiss, uh, very well known, is you know, it's, he's one of the most reputed experts in our sector. Uh, it has been a, uh, for me a pleasure to work with Werner over uh, many years already, uh, particularly in the framework of the European Technology and Innovation Platform on Renewability and Cooling, uh, of which Werner uh, has been uh, a part since the beginning uh, and a very active contributor. So um, Werner is a founding member and director of uh, 
Austrian Research Institute AE Intech in Gleiser, um, and is working in national and international solar thermal and energy efficiency projects since the beginning of the, the 1980s. So Werner is also co-author of the, the study Solar Heat Worldwide, uh, which we'll present uh, uh, shortly after this uh, initial presentation on IASHC. So Werner, it's my pleasure uh, to give you the floor currently. Thank you, Pedro, for the introduction. Um, yeah, as it was announced already, I will give you, before I come to my presentation on solar heat worldwide, I give you a short introduction on the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Solar Academy, or the Solar Heating and Cooling Program as such. So the, the program was established already in 1977 and is now one of 38 IEA technology collaboration programs. The SHC program has 20 member countries plus the European Commission and in addition for international organizations. So more than 400 experts from all five uh, continents contribute to our projects called TASKS. And at the moment we have eight running solar projects which focus on thermal storage, on building envelopes on PVT, so photovoltaic thermal systems, solar district heating systems, then uh, how to apply his, uh, solar energy in historic building renovation. Another focus is on daylighting, industrial water management, and last but not least, a new task on neighborhood planning. On the map, you can see the 20 member countries uh, and uh, the, this are uh, represented in red and the other so-called sponsors, uh, we have outreach to another 47 additional countries. Uh, so in the Solar Academy, we are sharing what we have learned and we have basically we have four possibilities to distribute our knowledge. One is these webinars. We have uh, quarterly webinars hosted by ISIS, one of it is today. Uh, then another possibility to see what we are doing are videos. Uh, they are usually uh, made at conferences where you can follow presentations to specific solar heating and cooling related topics. So just go on our website and uh, watch these videos. Then we organize national days. These are usually held in conjunction with our biannual executive committee meetings. The last was held just in May, beginning of May in Vienna. So just uh, follow it uh, to see it on our website when the next national day takes place. And last but not least, we offer on-site trainings uh, at the request of an IEA solar heating and cooling member country. We can send experts to this country to provide training and spe to specific solar thermal topics we had past trainings in China on solar district heating. We had another two in South Africa on solar process heat and on solar cooling, and uh, also one in the UK on solar district heating. Uh, you can find more information, of course, on our website. So visit our website or follow us on social media, as you can see here. With this, I switch over to my main presentation on solar heat worldwide on the edition 2019. I'm going to present you the main results of this edition. Uh, if you have detailed interest, just download the overall report, then you find, of course, even more detailed information. So the solar heat worldwide report is subdivided in two chapters. One is on the global market development and trends in 2018. And we have very detailed market figures from 68 countries from the year 2017. Um, yeah, this Solar Heat Worldwide report has already a long history. We started 15 years ago with 35 countries and extended to 68 countries. So that's how we started. And we are here now, so 68 countries. We have six uh, countries from Asia. We have China, 34 European countries, six from Latin America, 
eight from the MENA region, uh, the US and Canada from North America, Oceania, and 12 countries from Sub-Saharan Af Africa. And we estimate it's about 95% of the worldwide market is covered. So the global solar thermal market development and status in 2018. Um, the status at the moment is, uh, you can see here the development of the installed capacity between 2000 and the year 2018. And you can see that uh, the market grew from 62 gigawatt, which was approximately 90 million square meters of collectors in the year 2000, to 480 gigawatt installed capacity uh, in the year 2018, which relates to almost 700 million square meter installed capacity. The energy output, the energy yield of these systems is 396 terawatt hours. So that's the status. And if you compare our achievements with the other renewable energy technologies, you can see here on this slide, uh, the new renewable energy technologies besides hydropower and biomass. The blue bars show you the installed capacity and the red bars, the energy output or energy yield. What we can see here on the left-hand side, solar thermal, we have an installed capacity of 480 gigawatt. Uh, if you compare it to PV, we have 502 gigawatt installed capacity at the end of 2018. And this is the first time, so in 2018, photovoltaic overtook solar thermal in terms of installed capacity, but we are in the, almost in the same, or in the same range of installed capacity. Wind power is a little bit above with 591 gigawatt installed capacity, and the energy supplied in terawatt hours are shown in these red bars. And here you can mainly see the full load hours. Wind power, you can run 24 hours. Uh, if you have wind available and the solar technologies, of course, can run eight to 10 hours a day. This gives you the, the explanation of the energy supplied by the different technologies. So what are the environmental effects and contribution to the climate goals? So solar thermal yields, I mentioned it, amounted to almost 400 terawatt hours in 2018 which relates to 137 million tons of CO2 avoided. So that means solar thermal contributes significantly to reach the global climate goals. It comes to the oil equivalent. So the oil equivalent of the energy supplied is in the range of 42.6 million tons of oil annually. And employment and turnover. I think the solar thermal became really a job motor in a lot of countries, which cannot be uh, neglect neglectable. That means it's uh, 672,000 jobs worldwide, people working in planning, produ producing or installation of solar thermal systems. The turnover of the solar thermal industry worldwide is in the range of 15 billion uh, euro or 16, 17 billion US dollar. So it's already, already a significant factor also in terms of economy. So now the most important message I would say of this year's edition of Solar Heat Worldwide it's even if the thermal, solar thermal market on the worldwide or global scale uh, fell again by 3.9%, this is mainly related to the developments in China because China is by far the biggest market. Uh, we had a significant slowdown in the market decline in some countries and a very positive growth uh, in a lot of countries, especially in 10 of the top 20 countries worldwide. And as it looks now, if this trend continues, we will have again a significant market growth, uh, what we can expect in 2019. Going in some detail of these 10 uh, countries out of the top 20, so we had significantly 
significant growth rates in Poland with nearly 180%, 128% in Denmark, also in India, 17%, and with Cyprus, 5 and then Mexico, Greece with 4%, Australia, Spain, South Africa, and France with an increase of the market of 2%. So this uh, makes me quite optimistic that we can make the turnaround on the global scale as well, not just in Europe, but on the global scale as well in this year. If you look to the different application sectors, you have solar thermal systems, so in the small scale, uh, solar water heating systems. So that means for detached single family houses, apartment buildings, it's still something like 90% of the worldwide annual installations. This is sometimes underestimated or forgotten if we talk about the large scale impressive systems in solar district heating or uh, process heat installations. So it's still 90% of the world uh, market. And these applications are still under market pressure from heat pumps and photovoltaic systems. So I think you have really to focus on this type of systems uh, to come up with innovations to catch up uh, here as well and to have a good solution for the different applications. Switching now to the large scale solar thermal systems, you can see here the development of the large scale systems. So that means large scale is defined more bigger than 500 square meters or bigger than 350 kilowatt installed capacity. Uh, we can see here since the end of the 90s, there's a strong interest in these large scale systems. It was uh, especially in solar district heating, and it was driven at the beginning by Denmark and Sweden. So coming really from the north of Europe and since 2005, but more significant in the last two years, you can see it here also outside Europe. Uh, the European systems are shown here. The number of systems are shown here in orange and outside Europe, uh, the systems installed uh, outside Europe. So Europe in orange, outside Europe in red. And then you can see, uh, especially in 2018, there is a huge number of systems installed outside of Europe. So we can see nearly an exponential growth of these large scale systems. By the end of last year, we had 339 large scale systems connected to district heating networks or in residential buildings. And the total ins installed capacity of these systems is 1,240 megawatt or 1.7 million square meter of collector area. In more detail, uh, sorry, in 2018, 17 large scale solar systems with 85,000 square meters or 60 megawatt were installed uh, in Europe. Sorry, I jumped here over. No. Sorry. So um, outside Europe, 27 megawatt or 38,000 square meters were installed. A lot of these systems are installed in China and especially in Tibet. I just have here one slide on the Lankasi system with 15.6 megawatt installed capacity. And I think what's uh, interesting is that 90% uh, of the heating needs are coming from this solar thermal system. Another good uh, uh, example is a system in South Africa. It's the first of its kind in Sub-Sahara Africa. The first solar district heating network was installed in 2018 uh, with 500 57 square meters. It's installed at the Witwatersrand University uh, for 14 buildings are connected there. And it's also used for sector coupling. So it use, uses also the waste heat uh, from a generator, which was just wasted before. If you go to large scale systems in, in detail, this was the slide I was looking for before. Uh, you can see uh, that most of the systems on the left-hand side are installed in Denmark. Denmark has 117 systems installed with 
almost 1.4 million square meter. Uh, and then Denmark is followed by China with 21 systems, with uh, Germany with 34 systems, uh, Austria 31 systems, and then you have uh, Saudi Arabia with just one system, but a rather big system. The green bars show you the collector area. And then you have Sweden and the other countries you can see on, on this slide. What might be interesting is that in if you look to, to Denmark, there's 117 systems. So the average size in Denmark of the systems is eight megawatt per system. And you go to the other countries like Austria, France, Sweden, Poland, you can see the, the average size of this district heating systems is in the range of one megawatt per system. So there's a big difference between the large scale the Danish system. So on average, they're eight times bigger compared to the other leading countries here. Uh, before I go to solar heat for industrial processes, uh, I think it's uh, important to mention that uh, solar district heating enables, uh, gives really a good opportunity to make even bigger cities or towns 100% renewable heating because you use already existing infrastructure and feed in renewable heat such as solar heat. And I think that's what we really need to decarbonize cities. It's one of the major possibilities. Now, just uh, quite quick to solar heat for industrial processes. That's another uh, upcoming or new market since several years. In total, we have 741 uh, ship plants with an overall collector area of 660,000 square meters or 567 megawatt, which are installed worldwide. In terms of uh, collector area, and uh, so what was added in the year 2018, you can see in China, uh, 15 systems, in Mexico, quite a lot with 51 systems, then if two in France, 10 in India, nine in Germany, in Spain, and Austria, three, and 15 in different other countries. So in 2018, another 108 systems were added. Uh, what is the size of the systems? As you can see here, uh, the average size of the solar heat for industrial process is significantly smaller compared to the district heating systems. On average, it's 0.8 megawatt per system or 900 square meter per system. But I have to mention here that uh, this, we have to take into account that we have two very big systems. There's one with 30,000 square meters for a copper mine in Chile, and another one in Oman for advanced oil recovery, which has a collector area of 100,000 square meters. So you have to have this in mind if we talk about average sizes of the systems. Here you can see that the different sizes. So above 30,000 square meters, we have two systems, then in the range between 1,000 uh, there are 30,000 and 1,000 with 33 systems. Most of the systems in terms of numbers with 57 systems are in the range between 500 and 1,000 square meters. Uh, which collectors are used for this process heat installations? Most of the systems starting on the left hand side is with 139 systems, uh, flat plate collectors are used uh, in terms of uh, thermal capacity, uh, it's smaller than parabolic trough collectors, where we have uh, 107, uh, 58 sys systems. But here we have with parabolic trough collectors, the system in Oman, which I mentioned before already with already 100,000 square meters, one system. Then it's followed by evacuated tube collectors with the uh, 46 uh, systems. And then we have air collectors, unglazed collectors, and 13 systems with Fresnel collectors. If you go in the application sector, most of the systems are installed in the food and beverage industry. You can see here 112 systems in the food and 
31 systems in the beverage industry. But also textile with uh, 24 systems is significant. And the, the small number of systems, it's 14, is for mining, but has the biggest collector area. So here we have the biggest systems installed. You can see this on this green bar. Uh, where are the systems installed? You can see, starting again from the left-hand side, it's 81 systems in Mexico, 47 in India, uh, 27 in Austria, 26 in Germany, 19 in the, U in the US, and so forth. You can see the numbers here. So here, really, Mexico and India are leading in terms of number of systems, in terms of size. You can see the, the green bars again, it's China, it's Chile and it's Oman. Then we have, this year we have the first time we have included in the solar heat worldwide the PVT, but I don't go into detail here. My colleague Thomas Ramschak will go in detail on this. Solar cooling, quite quick, is still a small niche market. Unfortunately, even if solar cooling has a huge potential, especially in the medium to large scale, capacity, uh, but it's still a niche market. We have listed here the bigger systems on solar cooling between 2008 and 2018. And you can see in 2018, you got another three big systems were installed. Two of those are in Italy and one in Jordan. Um, the part two of the solar heat worldwide report is on detailed market figures in 2017. Uh, as I mentioned already at the beginning, it's from 68 countries. I don't want to go in detail here. So if you want to know what is installed in your specific country, just download the report and you can find all the detailed data from 68 countries. Uh, it, I just have one slide or two slides, sorry, uh, from this chapter, the total installed capacity in operation by the end of 2017, you can see that 70% of the total installed, so accumulated in, in, installed collector area or capacity is in China, 11.5% in Europe, and 17.9% is in, I would say, rest of the world, uh, subdivided in 4% in the US and Canada. 2.9% in Latin America, 28 in Asia without China. Then we have 1.5% in the MENA region, 1.4% in Australia and New Zealand, 0.3% in sub saharan Africa, and then we have 5% in other countries. That's an estimation where we have no detailed figures. What I should mention, for years, China increased the share, and now it's already for two years This China is gradually losing the market share in total terms, but nevertheless, it, it's 17.6%. So it's the dominating market worldwide. If you look on the top 10 countries of the accumulated collectors, collector installation, you see on the, on the top, you see the absolute and on the bottom, the installed capacity per 1,000 cap capita. But you can see China is leading, as I mentioned already, uh, but in terms of installed capacity per 1,000 inhabitants, it's number eight worldwide. And on the other hand, we can see that we have the top 10 countries, amongst the top 10 countries, there are six, which are also top 10 countries in on the one hand, in absolute terms, but also in terms of installed capacity per capita. So these are really the six leading countries in both respects, in absolute terms or per capita. If you want to know more and in more detail, just go to the IA SHC website and you download the overall report then you find significantly more detailed information and especially for your country. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Werner. Um, he did quite comprehensive and uh, and interesting uh, overview of the market developments. We uh, will now have the opportunity to go into some aspects uh, in more detail. So our next speaker, speaker Thomas Hamshak, is also working at AE Intech. Uh, he, he holds a master degree in mechanical engineering and business economics and is currently a research associate at IE Intec, and uh, the focus areas of his research are thermal energy technologies and hybrid systems. So he's also a subtask leader of IEA SHE Task 60 uh, on application of PVT collectors. Uh, and it has been in this uh, context that he uh, has carried the study um, that he's going to present. This is the most comprehensive analysis of the PVT sector carried out so far. So we're glad to have Thomas sharing with it, uh, it with us, uh, in particular, some of the main findings of the study. So Thomas, thank you very much, and uh, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good afternoon um, to everybody, and thank you, Pedro, for the nice in uh, introduction. Um, thanks also to the organizer for the speaking slot. So just uh, to make sure, can you see my screen right now? No, not yet. There we go. Perfect. Thanks. There, now, yes, yes. You, you can see my full screen. Okay, perfect. So, um, as mentioned, yeah, um, my name is uh, Thomas Hamschak from iintech and uh, I'm very um, excited to be here with you um, to present you results of uh, activities um, of the uh, IA Task 60 uh, application of um, PVT collectors. Um, the link here you can see here on the um, on, on the button right. So, and uh, my presentation um, is about um, PBT systems, uh, um, and and I want to give you actual market and um, data uh, market figures. So, um, now a short introduction uh, to the structure of the um, PBT task. So, it's uh, it's running since approximately one and a half year. Um, with a total duration of three years. So operating agent uh, is Sean Christoph Adam uh, from Switzerland. And you can see here our uh, four subtasks. These four subtasks are uh, the number one, um, PVT systems in operation, uh, led by me from Aintec uh, from Austria, um, where the main objective is to gather data and report information. Uh, on heating and uh, cooling systems with uh, PVT um, collectors in operation. Then we have um, the task uh, PVT performance characterization, uh, which is led by um, Corinne and Kramer from ISE in Germany. Um, the task here is uh, how to test and characterize and report um, PVT collectors and, and systems. The third um, task is on PVT system modeling, is led by uh, Asa Sanz from Technalia in Spain. And fourth, uh, fourth subtask D is on um, performance assessments, dissemination, and market support, led by Andreas Hevele from uh, Espref uh, in, in Switzerland. So, in, in short, um, Subtask E is on in situ situation of uh, PVT systems um, in the field. Subtask B is on the lab characterization. Subtask C is on uh, simulation modeling of PVT systems. And Subtask D on evaluation and communication um, on, uh, on PV. So, um, during um, one of uh, the first meetings, um, subtask or task meetings, we had the idea that it might be a good start to uh, conduct a, a market survey on PBT systems to identify current PBT examples and um, to provide an overview uh, on the present status um, of the PBT uh, technology worldwide and to spread the results via the different channels. So um, as uh, Werner mentioned, every year uh, the Thriller Heat Worldwide report describes general trends and describes successful, uh, successful applications. And in the 2019 edition, um, we included uh, for the first time um, an overview of the PBT systems and highlighted uh, the sector. So this um, part of the uh, report takes a look at the PVT market um, worldwide, but uh, with a special focus 
um, on Europe. So, and um, the results of this market study I will present you uh, today. Um, a questionnaire have been sent um, to approximately 60 PVT manufacturer where we uh, have gathered uh, a lot of uh, a lot of informations. Um, finally, we received um, completed questionnaires from 26 manufacturers uh, of um, PVT collectors from from LM countries. Um, in a few cases of the remaining PVT manufacturers, the manufacturers have um, keyed their uh, their production of uh, PVT collectors. Um, become also uh, insolvent or we have um, PVT manufacturers which produce modules um, also for for other for other companies. So there are for sure um, other manufacturers that are not included here, uh, especially smaller producers um, or or manufacturers from other parts of the world. Um, but for Europe, uh, we think uh, most of the relevant players participated uh, in this survey. So um, the the majority of this uh, of the manufacturer comes from um, from the Netherlands uh, with six manufacturers, followed by France, Switzerland, uh, Australia, and Italy with uh, three each. And we also received informations um, from uh, manufacturers from the countries Germany, Israel, Australia. Spain, uh, the UK, and also um, the US. In the survey, we classified the manufacturer by type of, um, of collectors. So the PVT collectors um, considered in, in this uh, survey can be divided into the three main categories, um, which are the, the water or liquid cooled um, collectors. We have um, the air collectors and uh, the concentrated um, PVT collectors. So for the water collectors, uh, we have additionally, um, in addition, the subcategories uncovered, um, covered, and evacuated cube, uh, tubes. So and um, here uh, you can see exemplary products uh, for each category. Um, yeah, uh, you can you can see here at uh, at the right. Um, this pie chart uh, shows the distribution of the PVT manufacturer by by type of collector. So it can already be stated that the vast majority of the manufacturer offered um, liquid cooled collectors. 48% of the manufacturer don't have um, don't have a, a cover. Um, at, uh, at, at the front in comparison to the 28% where the collectors are equipped um, with uh, an additional cover. We have um, one manufacturer which uh, offers both um, a covered and a covered um, PVT, um, yeah, a covered and a co uncovered PVT collector. And the remaining uh, quarter um, of the manufacturers offers yeah the evacuated tubes um, the air collectors and uh, the concentrators. Um, as I mentioned, um, we we also collected the cumulated um, manufactured collector area by the end of uh, 2018, and um, in total approximately 1.1 million. Um, PBT collector area were manufactured and uh, and installed. So um, the 1.1 million square meter is, an, from my point of view, an absolute significant um, number. And if we compare it to the total installed um, solar thermal collector area in in Europe, um, PV uh, achieved a market share of um, yeah roughly one one and uh, and a half percent. Um, more in detail. More than a half um, of the installed collector area are uh, uncovered um, collectors produced by um, 12 manufacturers, and 41% are PVT uh, air collectors, mainly produced by by two manufacturers. And um, we have two percent. Um, yeah, these are uh, the 
the covered, uh, covered collectors. The other collector types um, plays a minor role uh, in, in this statistic. When we um, consider also the trading, so imported export um, of PBT collectors between uh, the countries, so we uh, um, also get, uh, got this information from, from the manufacturer. Um, this world map shows the installed collector area worldwide based on the data of um, the 26 um, PBT manufacturer. So we have um, PBT installation in, in the US, in Latin America, um, in Europe, in Asia, and also PBT collectors installed in, in Africa and, and also uh, in Australia. Um, when we take a closer look to the European market, um, France is leading the market with an installed collector area of approximately 414,000 um, uh, square meter, followed by Germany with uh, 110,000 square meter, and the Netherlands and Italy uh, with an installed collector area um, in the range of uh, 15,000 square meter each. So um, we can also see um, that, for example, in France, mainly uh, air collectors are installed. Uh, you can see here it in, in blue. While uh, in Germany, uncovered collector um, yeah, are, are dominant. In general, the manufacturer um, produce mainly for their domestic uh, market, and um, thus we have the different uh, in the different countries, depending on the manufacturer, different um, PV collectors um, installed. To, um, to derive the nominal capacity from the area of the installed uh, collectors, we also collected this data from the manufacturer as a basis for a statistical approach um, for the different collector types. And um, here you can see the 10 leading countries um, in the graph. And, um, but if you are interested in details, uh, you can look um, for your country um, also in the, in the overall report. By the end uh, of 2018, a total thermal capacity of um, PVT modules uh, of um, yeah, 524 megawatts thermal and uh, nominal PV power of uh, 178 um, megawatt peak were installed. And um, as I showed uh, one uh, on, the, on the world map, uh, France is uh, leading um, with, uh, with, the with the more than 450,000 square meters, which corresponds to um, 215,000 kilowatt um, thermal and 70,000 kilowatt um, peak PV, followed by, by the countries uh, Korea, China, Germany, um, Israel, and, and so on. In Israel, um, there is one manufacturer producing approximately 50% um, of the total installed um, PVT collector area worldwide. And uh, this um, manufacturer has also a high share um, of exports to the countries, um, to the countries Korea and, and to China. In China uh, itself, the PVT market um, seems to be uh, very small at the moment, um, but uh, I think this can um, change, uh, change quickly. So um, in, in my next uh, topic, I want to show you the application um, for PBT collectors and the uh, installed systems. So by the end of 2018, more than 22,900 um, systems corresponding to um, approximately 581,000 square meters um, are documented. A collector area of approximately uh, 500,000 square meter cannot be classified. These are mainly export um, collectors where we don't have um, this kind of, uh, of information. Um, but once again, what we can see, um, solar air systems with the uh, solar air collectors uh, dominate these statistics. 
um, but apart from from the solar uh, air systems where approximately 2,000 uh, 20,000 uh, systems were in operation. The uncovered um, PVT collectors are the most uh, common technology, um, which is uh, also reflected in the number uh, in the number of, uh, of systems. By the end of um, 2000, uh, 2018, uh, 22,000 systems of uncovered um, PVT collectors uh, when when operation, and out of these systems. Um, Approximately 75% were used for for domestic hot water preparation in, in single-family houses, multi-family houses, hotels, and hospitals, and so on. And um, often also in combination uh, with uh, with heat pumps. Around 21% um, of the system supply electricity for the household, uh, together with um, heat for for domestic hot water and space heating. So we have um, also the, the combi systems. The remaining systems <clears throat> deliver energy to other applications um, such as industrial processes, district heating uh, networks um, and swimming pools, for example. The covered PVT collectors um, you, can, you can see in, in orange. Um, are mainly used uh, for for the combi systems, so for solar hot water preparation and um, and space heating. In my <clears throat> in my last sorry in my last three slides, I want to show you a few examples um, how these PVT systems uh, look like look like for the different collector types and the different um, applications. In <clears throat> in this picture. Um, you can see a PVT systems installed in Switzerland uh, in a village um, with uh, seven apartment houses. The roofs of the seven apartment houses have an east-west east -west orientation and um, have also have um, solar systems uh, on both sides. The PVT systems um, with a total of uh, 672 square meters uh, is installed on four of these buildings and um, comprises uncovered, uh, uninsulated um, PVT water collectors. So the heat, um, the heat supply in general, in general for for this village is based on on heat pumps um, and uh, on uh, and on a ground source um, with uh, with boreholes. So the heat from the PVT collectors is primarily used uh, for the regeneration. Um, of the borehole field, but it's uh, in this case it can also be used um, as source heat um, directly for for the heat pumps. The solar thermal output um, is approximately 400 um, kilowatt hours um, per year, and uh, this is in total around 268 megawatts per year. And the annual amount of uh, heat extracted from the ground uh, is also in that range. So that means that um, that the ground source uh, can be fully, nearly fully be, uh, regenerated by the by the PVD, uh, PVT collectors. On the electrical um, side of the PVT systems, the electrical yield um, of of these systems uh, of this system is uh, is uh, in the range of um, 130 kilowatt uh, per square meter. Another um, typical example for the use of PVT collectors um, is the installation uh, you can see here. Here, um, 90 hybrid um, solar panels were. Where the panels are covered and uh, the rear side uh, is insulated. They are installed in this case uh, at the luxury resort uh, in Ibiza and generate electricity and um, heat uh, simultaneously for, for preheating um, of domestic hot water and um, for, uh, for self-consumption of, um, of the electricity. So um, the solar installation with a um, total solar surface of uh, 148 square meters um, led to a generation of more than uh, 112 um, megawatt hours per year of uh, thermal energy, which uh, represents um, 
in this case, a contribution of uh, more than 20% of the total uh, hotel, hotel domestic hot water um, demand. And uh, additionally, the um, PBT field generates uh, around um, 35 megawatt hours um, per year for uh, of electricity for for the general use. So, and this um, contributes also um, to decrease uh, the final CO2 emission in the um, value of more than um, 41 um, tons uh, CO2 um, per year. And in my last slide, um, I mentioned uh, already um, the PBT collectors are or can be also used um, for industrial applications. And this is one picture um, from a PBT plant uh, in the Netherlands where um, 88 low concentrating um, PBT collectors were installed on the flat roof um, of the buildings and produces heat and electricity um, for the daily uh, demand on, in, in a cheese factory. So um, in this case, the PVT systems, the PVT system um, preheats water up to uh, 75 degree uh, in the summer where the um, water is used for, for cleaning processes. And um, the electricity um, can be used or, or is used uh, in general for the, for the production. So um, I hope I could give you a brief overview of the actual um, PBT market. And yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, and I thank you, but the participants also for the questions you have been uh, sending uh, as referred before. We will address uh, as much of your questions we, as possible um, in the Q&A uh, part, which will come up after the next presentation. So next presentation from uh, uh, Berbel Lab, um, which is also a pleasure to meet, to, to introduce to you. Uh, Berbel is an extremely well-known journalist uh, covering for around 20 years the solar thermal sector. The, um, she is also the founder and managing director of the agency Solrico uh, and the news editor of SolarThermalWorld.org. Uh, Besides being an ad, author and collaborator in many relevant publications, uh, one of the examples is the Solid Cooling Market, an industry in the REN21 Global Status Report. Barbell and, and uh, Solrico have been dedicating more attention to solar heating industrial processes, publishing some relevant reports also in the frame of the international project Solar Payback. So Solar present, uh, Barbell will present uh, recent developments uh, related to different applications in our industry and also in terms uh, of policy. So Barbell, thank you very much and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks Pietro for the nice introduction. Yeah, we have heard a lot of market data already. So my point uh, this afternoon will be rather on the industry part of it. We have done a lot of industry surveys as part of the preparation for the Global Status Report, which was already mentioned. My name is Bärbel Epp and Sorico is a network of global solar thermal experts around the world. And we mainly focus on, you know, solar heating and cooling markets. What is the Global Status Report? It's an annual policy advocacy report um, covering the whole range of renewable energies. 336 pages was this year's copy, including 80 pages of endnotes. It's fairly relevant, 70,000 times downloaded over the year. And so RICO was responsible for the solar heating and cooling chapter. You can download the report summary and key charts under this link. The report was launched mid-June in five events around the world and the press release was published in nine languages. And I would like to read out to you some of the key messages from this 330 page report. The first one, solar PV and wind are now mainstream options in the power sector. For the fourth consecutive year, more renewable power capacity was installed than fossil fuel and nuclear power combined, which is 
98 gigawatt PV power was newly installed in 2018 and 52 gigawatt wind power compared to 33 gigawatt solar thermal power or oh, heat. You already see that we are a bit, we are number three, but we are a bit, uh, you know, in the shade. So this is what they also constated in their uh, press release. Renewables supply more than 26% of global electricity. However, only 10% of heating and cooling and 3% of transport. This imbalance between energy sectors is in large parts due to insufficient or unstable policy support. So they take a lot of effort in this report to look at policies, to count policies in place, to pound targets in place. And they always come to the conclusion that there are many more countries on policy electricity, um, having policy electricity in place rather than heat. And they stress this in this press release. And the last uh, very important message from the press release was a breakthrough could occur if countries cut their fossil fuel subsidies. In 2017, around 300 billion US dollars was used to subsidize fossil fuel consumption globally. If we compare this to the 16 billion that solar heating and cooling has done as a turnover, not at subsidy, as a turnover in 2018, we see that we have a very unbalanced energy system still. It's a big report, what is worth reading? The blue arrows show you the solar heating and cooling chapters. So you found a particular chapter on cooling and heating in the global overview on the policy landscape and in market and industry trends. And I really recommend you to look into these chapters because they're really dense and include a lot of up-to-date information on the year 2018. So one of the key bases we uh, sort of uh, drafted our um, chapter of was this ranking of the largest flat blade collector manufacturers that we produce in several years. You see the collector area produced by these companies in 2018. The number, it's, uh, it's a total collector production, meaning um, domestic sales and export. And you see very clear that China is dominating this ranking. For the last two years, the five top places were sort of occupied by Chinese companies. Where does this come from? We see a big shift in China at the moment from newly installed flat plate collectors to, or from vacuum tubes to flat plate collectors. So here we compare 2015 newly installed figures with 2018 newly installed figures. And you see that the vacuum tubes reduced by 10 million and uh, flat plate collectors increased from 5.5 million to 6.2 million. So this is now about three times the number of, of collectors that is produced, that is installed each year in Europe. Overall, the Chinese market is still shrinking, but within this shrinking, you have a more or less constant engineering segment and you have a very strong declining retail segment. This was already mentioned by Werner before because of heat pump, uh, you know, competition and a, a certain saturation. So 17 million square meter was still sold in this um, segment in 2015, and this is now down to 9.6 million. And we are not sure whether 2019 will really already show the, the turn turnaround or whether this decline will still bring the market down. So again, to the ranking, another interesting fact we have examined at this year's ranking was that the Southern European collector manufacturers did very well in 2018, according to their production. This was, they could have uh, increased their overall uh, production by 7%. And this was because they saw increasing demand in some uh, Arabic countries as well as African countries. We have in another survey asked the key uh, solar water heater kit manufacturers which were their key mark export markets in 2018 and you see the ranking here. So 12 companies uh, named Spain as one of the key export markets. Italy was also named 10 because of the nice subsidy they have. And then you already have a Gulf state, which is the United Arab Emirates, which have a very strong and, and efficient solar obligation, which forces all new built building constructors to cover 75% of the hot water demand with solar. And as there is a lot of uh, 
uh, construction going on. So this is a prospering market for um, producers because in the countries itself, there's no production yet. So you see Portugal, Morocco, Germany, Chile are also named, but not in this high numbers. Again, back to the ranking, the red arrows show the three German uh, heating manufacturers and they actually declined their sales again uh, by minus 8%. The German market declined again in 2018 by minus 8% and as in the past years, these, uh, well, German-based uh, com collector manufacturers, which are globally in global business, but still are very depending on the German market, declined as the German market declined. The big winner of this year's uh, ranking was Hevalex, who jumped uh, a lot of places up in the ranking. And this is because uh, uh, Poland has a very nice uh, clean air policy in place and supports uh, a lot of uh, municipalities to install solar water heaters in Hevalex uh, against the coal boilers, you know, to reduce coal and, and dust in the air. And Tivalex claimed to have installed 4,300 residential solar water heater units in seven municipalities in 2018. And so the Polish market jumped up significantly last year. And this is the figures that were already recorded by Werner before. So 179% in Poland is due to this clean air policy. But um, we are not that sure, this is not a, a constant market growth again, because these uh, clean air policies, they were tender based and uh, they seem to shift again back away from solar heat in the coming years. The other um, astonishing high figure comes from Denmark with 128% increase in 2018. But first, I would like to stress that you find all these absolute figures in the GSR, you know, in table R19, page 221, you find the absolute figures for the 20 largest markets 2018 and their added capacities. So what about Denmark? Denmark had actually a big increase in 2018, but this was due to a very weak year 2017. This chart shows you the accumulated newly installed collector area over the years and you see that between 2015 and 2016 there was a very big jump. This was due to a policy in place where the utilities had to bring online their solar district heating plants in 2016 uh, to, to make it be counted as an energy saving measure that they were required for by the ministry. After that, it took uh, about two years, you know, to bring the market back to a certain drive because solar district heating is a long-term development process. So we have added now again, um, I think five systems and several extensions with 70,000 square meters solar district heating in 2018. And this is where the jump comes from. All in all, I would like to stress the fact that we always looked at Denmark in the past years when you looked at solar district heating. But my idea is that the solar district heating markets in the next years will diversify a lot. We see a lot of interesting activities coming up, in, especially in China, where solar district heating is highly subsidized in Tibet, in Inner Mongolia, in Shandong, in Hebei, all because of clean policy in place, you know, clean air policies in place. And we also have these countries which are marked here with a white bar, which is Austria, Germany, France, Italy, Netherlands, Serbia, Slovenia, and Spain, which also subsidize renewable district heating, which is usually part of solar thermal is also part of this. So in this chart, which is an infographic that we developed for task 55 of the IAA solar heating and cooling, you see the attractiveness of solar district heat or well district heating market in terms of solar usage. And we have the, the huge market in China and you have the, the front runner sort of in terms of technology, which are the green market countries on the right top. You have the very uh, big, but but uh, in a very bad state of, of art uh, of district heating in Russia and Ukraine. And you have this medium size emerging markets, which will become fairly interesting, like Spain and Latvia, for example, have announced big installations that are under construction and planning phase. France has done some bigger state uh, systems. Netherlands have nice subsidy. So we will hear from a lot more countries in terms of solar district heating in the coming years. 
Well, in solar industrial heat, another big important commercial segment was mentioned by Werner with all the market figures that we um, in well that we gathered. But my tenor is this year it's a tough business. And why do I say this? Because we have sent a survey to 82 ship technology suppliers as part of the solar payback project and 93 of them were not satisfied with their sales in 2018. This is because only 32 ship suppliers out of this 82 were able to install one ship system or more last year. So that seems that the market is still a very tough one. This is, if you ask for the reasons, the manufacturers tell you this is still because of the low oil and gas prices, difficult to uh, obtain financing and the lack of awareness among industrial clients. Um, another trend that we have analyzed is regarding the collector area. Just a short notice, vacuum tube collectors dominate the market in terms of new ship capacity 2018, followed by parabolic draft collectors. Linear Fresnel with 360 didn't play a big role at all in 2018, and DISH is only used with 2,800 square meters here for commercial cooking in India and nowhere else in the world. The, you find all these results actually on this map, which is from solar-payback.com. We have listed the 82 suppliers on this map. Actually, you find under each supplier the number of references in chip they have declared with a collector area. We link to the references of the ship supply of the ship plant map that Werner already mentioned, and we mention whether this company is producing a collector or not. So we have here companies that um, have already uh, installed references and others which are ready to offer. And the idea of this map is to show new clients that there are a, a number, a big number of motivated and also experienced technology suppliers already that can offer ship solutions. We also have um, uh, more and more integrated photos onto the solar-payback.com website. This, this photo gallery is also available in English, Spanish and Portuguese. You are very welcome to download photos. They are always free of charge and you only have to mention the copyright owner. <coughs> Sorry. Well, another interesting outcome from the ship supply world map was that heat supply contracts become more popular but hard to implement. Why do I say this? because 80% of these 82 companies that we questioned as ship technology suppliers do agree with the fact that it's the second bar. Energy heat delivery contracts are an important model to increase ship deployment, but only 42 of them has ever offered or realized uh, a ship ESCO system. So this business model, which is called, you know, to supply heat contracts instead of hardware technology is, is uh, very attractive for the client because you don't need um, to, you don't need to have uh, of financing in place and you don't have a risk of the technology, but for the ESCO itself or the technology supplier, it still seems a big barrier. But what is very promising and very encouraging that we have identified three trends over the last year, 2018, that increase the number of ESCOs in the solar thermal supply chain. First, we have several system suppliers that have added heat supply contracts successfully to their portfolio. And this is Modulo Solar from Mexico, who has already six contracts in place. Linuo Paradigma from China has founded an ESCO daughter company and they are confident that they will have the first project realized in the second half of 2019. And Millennium Energy Industries from Jordan has, is in these weeks, in the next two, two or three weeks, will sign the first big contract with a heat supply company um, and they have started this in their portfolio. So this is good news from this side. 
we also have a number of startup companies which focus on heat contracting and this is for example new heat in france they just inaugurated their first esco project i think it was last year it's a paper mine in france and we have the austrian company sva solar wärme which concentrates on campgrounds and other smaller uh, heat uh, demand uh, supply uh, heat heat uh, needers in austria and uh, they have done i think two systems now and the th third group that drives this market towards ESCO are financing facilitators, which were so far mostly in the renewable electricity field, which is power purchase agreements. One example is QTherm in France, and they now include solar heat as well to their portfolio. And QTherm is planning a 15,000 square meter system for a melting plant, a ship plant in France as ESCO model. Well. Another important fact that we have to look at is concentrating technologies. And I found it striking that in the year 2018, we have seen a number of interesting new deals, new contracts were signed for concentrating solutions. And the player behind that is more or less the US-based glass point. We have, they have under construction a one gigawatt project in Oman since 2016. 100 megawatt is in place now. They want to add another 200 megawatt this year. And they have recently in the last 12 months signed two more deals for this kind of uh, huge ship plants, which is an 850 megawatt plant in Beldridge in California and another two gigawatt uh, system in Oman with an oil producer. So all this is an oil oil recovery. That means you pump heat into the ground to make oil more liquid like. And we are talking here about three gigawatt of capacity and if you compare this to the 350 megawatt of concentrating collector technology that we had roughly in operation for heat purposes at the end of 2018 we are looking at a huge increase in the next years and a big shift towards concentrating solutions a small system, but a very relevant one for Brazil is under construction with parabolic draft collectors. It's a Philip Morris installation to dry tobacco in a farm and produce electricity with 8.3 megawatt. So I'm coming to the end and I want to summarize the positive trends that I recovered from the year 2018. I think there is a rising interest among commercial and industrial clients. We have seen a lot of large systems, contract signing, announcements of large solar district heating systems in new markets like Oman, Spain and Latvia. We have this clean air policies driving markets in Poland and China. We have uh, increasing demand for residential soda water heaters in completely new markets like Middle East and East and Central Africa, where we will hear a lot from in the next years, I'm sure, because the Greece companies, the Greek manufacturers continuously increase their exports in these regions as well. So there are nice markets coming up. We have this growing number of businesses offering ESCO. And we have uh, an increasing number of countries offering financial support for especially solar district heating, which is understood as the most cost effective way to decarbonize the heating sector and will also drive uh, a lot of growth in our market. So I thank you very much and open for questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Berbel. A uh, very good uh, overview of uh, the, the, the trends uh, in the business and in the different segments. So thank you very much for that. So we have a lot of questions, so many different topics to cover. Uh, we have com uh, questions related to the, to the statistics in general. Um, there are some questions also on, on uh, specific uh, procedures uh, at statistical level that uh, um, I propose that we uh, can address um, uh, at the end of the Q&A or maybe um, if, if we don't have the time in written. But we have also uh, on the different segments. So we have on solar cooling, on uh, solar in, uh, heat for industrial processes, uh, PVT, uh, many also. So um, I propose we start by uh, the general parts and um, on the on the global statistics and we have questions on uh, specific markets um, 
so I think uh, uh, Berbel was already addressing questions on the, the growth in, in some markets uh, like Denmark, for instance. Um, but we have uh, um, from Lema Clemens uh, a question uh, that I will put to you, Werner, um, regarding uh, Latin American countries, that there isn't, uh, there doesn't seem to be too much activity there. Um, do you have more information um, about uh, this region and uh, what is happening there? And so complementing with, uh, with uh, the overall business trends uh, from Berbel. Uh, if I understood you right, it's a question if you have more information on other other countries or... In Latin America. Yeah. Well, we have, from Latin America, we have, if I remember right, it, it's uh, something like six countries where we have detailed market market figures. And we are looking every year for new contacts to, to add more countries. So if a country is missing in, in the report and you have contacts or you are one of the persons who have this data available, we are more than happy to add these other countries. What we need is reliable data and we need it long term, not just for one year. We need it every year because we have now really 15 years uh, of uh, time record. So the countries we have listed, they are in and we are more than happy to add others. Uh, very good, thank you very much. Um, there was also uh, um, a question on the, um, uh, the fact that uh, India is a, a, a strongly growing market, but there are other markets which already have uh, um, a much larger cumulative uh, installations. So this is a question from Yadip uh, Malavia. Um, can, can you uh, explain a bit and also how the assessment is done between the growing uh, and, and annual sales and, uh, and the cumulative uh, capacity and what uh, um, in regard to the statistical procedure for lifetime of the systems. Uh, also for you, Werner, please. Yeah. Uh, if we start from, from your last question, so lifetime, we take 20 years of, uh, 25 years of lifetime. In general, if we have no other uh, information from the country. So that means if there is an official lifetime from a country, then we take uh, the official lifetime from the statistics of the, of the country. If this is not available, uh, then we assume a 25 years lifetime and then we take out the old systems so we don't accumulate forever. Uh, just to give an example, for China, there's the official statistic, they take out, so they assume a service lifetime of only 10 years. So after 10 years, we take all the older uh, systems out of the statistic. But you find this information in the report in detail in the annex, where you find exactly the lifetime we take for every country. The other one was uh, the accumulated installed capacity. As I said, we have now 15 years uh, record in this statistic. So we usually take official statistics from the countries. And when we started, we started with accumulated uh, installations and we added every year the new installations and deducted the old ones. So they are older than the service lifetime. So therefore, we get several times the question, uh, why doesn't it fit exactly together? So from last year's edition, if I add the new installation, it doesn't fit together. This comes because we deduct the old systems which are going out of, of the service lifetime. So I hope this uh, could explain the annual statistics, annual numbers and accumulated. Okay, um, one more clarification in terms of technology, which was to um, from Leo Olm, uh, if you can explain uh, what is the difference between solar heating and cooling um, and uh, solar thermal electricity, so concentrated solar power. So we don't take, in our statistics in solar heat worldwide, we don't take into consideration uh, 
concentrating solar systems which produce uh, which are mainly used for electricity production so they are not in our statistics we have in the solar heat worldwide just parabolic or concentrating systems if the energy is used after so the heat is used uh, directly or indirectly in, in processes of uh, district heating even if the parabolic trough might be the same technology but we have in our statistics just the heat applications don't take the others for power into account okay thank you very much um for um uh Berbel and and werner uh, if you can clarify so um there are several questions regarding more information about uh, um uh, the use of solar heating and cooling uh, solar heating and cooling yes uh, solar heat for industrial processes so um how to find examples of uh, industrial air uh, air solar heating systems or plants uh, in the in the us um or in uh, to understand also uh, why uh, mexico uh, has so many new installations so where can uh, participants find more details on on this kind of uh, uh, questions yeah maybe thank you for the question i think the ship markets are very diverse and very different uh, developing actually the the mexican market phenomenon i would call it because they are really the market leader in terms of ship plants um, is a pure commercial one it seems that the energy prices are at least um, what coal and diesel is concerned gas is difficult to beat but coal and diesel is uh, expensive so wherever diesel boilers and coal boilers are used for steam production in the industry or even for other purposes um, uh, you know solar thermal can be cost competitive and we have a very uh, good uh, supply chain so a very experienced long-term suppliers which uh, have done solar thermal already for the thir last 30 years for hospitals for hotels for all kinds of commercial clim clim clients and they are now dealing with the ship market so uh, where can you find more information on that? Uh, Solar-payback.com. We have reported some uh, activities about Mexico. You can always consult the plant-info.com. No, dot .info site. No, ship-plant.info site, which Werner uh, quoted, where you find particular projects in the countries and there are lots of Mexican projects um, where you can see the application, the collector area, the name, the year of installation and you can consult uh, the ship supplier world map where you find the technology providers which are behind these systems and the drive of these systems. I hope that this answered a bit. Uh, I just want to add, thank you Bebel, I just want to add uh, for this uh, ship plants database as you mentioned it's ship-plants.info and what there you find all the information on the different countries which systems are installed there what's the size what's the collector uh, used uh, also some economic figures and it would be excellent so it's if you have systems you know about you can add these systems in this database so that would be really helpful to collect more systems worldwide. So this is really open. If you know about some systems, just go to this uh, ship-plants.info and add your systems you might know, or if you look for some, you will find them for your country. And last but not least, there was a question on air heating systems, solar air heating systems. We have a chapter, it's chapter 4.6 in the report. There you find information on solar air heating systems. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I will bring one more question on uh, SHIP for the moment. And uh, um, it's a request for clarification on um, if it's possible. And uh, there, there was quite some curiosity on the, the use of solar thermal for oil extraction. Uh, some people are more critical on the use of renewables for uh, extracting oil uh, as being uh, um, something contradictory. But one of the questions is regarding the temperatures and the use uh, of solar thermal above uh, 250 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. 
so can can you explain uh, what is the status of these uh, high temperature uh, solutions and again i address uh, Bearable uh, and or Werner um, with this question Well, I can just briefly comment on that. My feeling is that the 170 systems that Werner, uh, you know, counted or we all together counted for the new year 2018, most of them are below 150 degrees and even below 100 degrees. So the big, I mean, in Mexico, for example, you hardly find any systems above 100 degrees. So uh, this is still a big exception to have uh, systems above 250. I must lie about glass point, but they are they, they are producing directly steam. So they are they are using groundwater, and uh, it's a very. I mean, you can say what you want. I mean, they are distributing gas. You know, they are uh, they are uh, saving gas. I mean, they are exploiting oil. So that is the crew. That is the bad side of it. But they are substituting gas, and they are using groundwater and be heating it up to become steam, and uh, just pump it down in through the ground. So I'm fairly sure that they reach temperatures uh, above 250 degree, um, but I must, well, I had to look into my old articles to find out which degree. So Merna, maybe you have information on that, but I mean, the biggest part of ship, what is realized nowadays is really still uh, far below 150. Yeah, to my knowledge, uh, it's also the, in Oman, the glass point systems are below 250. I have lost. Uh, you have lost Werner, but I think he wanted to say below 200. Yeah, it's steam level, but still below 200. Yeah, so, so I, I think. I, mm. Okay, I will move to some of the, the questions on PVT. We have quite a lot. I was trying to find the best way to group them because we have questions more related to the market, uh, economic uh, aspects, and some, uh, let's say, uh, competitiveness of uh, PVT systems and other more technical. Um, uh, Thomas, I will start with uh, what I think is quite a challenging one, uh, and I don't know if you have an answer for this, um, which is for uh, from Robert Manser, and uh, um, if it's possible to indicate a, a trend for the next five years in terms of growth forecast for PVT, and which of the segments would uh, would have the most potential. Thomas, we cannot hear you. I think we've now lost both Thomas and Werner. They are appearing as offline in the system. Okay, so, so we, we have some internet uh, problems yeah. in uh, in Gleisov. Okay, but then um, I will go uh, back to you, uh, Berbel, um, because we also have some questions on the um, related to the to the last part on the on the on the business model. Let's say. Um, you have mentioned, uh, um, or I can I can be more more uh, precise on the question. Just looking for it. The um, sorry, I uh, I cannot track it now. But um, maybe you can also give an insight on another topic, which is um, that there is um, um, still the need to bring awareness. Uh, um, worldwide about uh, the, the use of solar thermal, the potential of solar thermal, um, and uh, the need for um, adequated policies. So could you um, please uh, tell us if you have any concrete uh, 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 view on this uh, that you can share with us? <laughs> yeah, very interesting uh, topic, actually. I mean, a successful ship supporting structures uh, do not really exist yet, I would say, <laughs> because what we have, maybe France will be an example where we see that it will work, but we have seen that the German uh, support scheme doesn't really pick up. Austria has more solar district heating than ship plants. We have so seen subsidies in Denmark, which didn't really work. And um, it works on a commercial basis. That's what we see in, um, 
uh, like in, in Mexico. India has a support scheme in place, 30% subsidies um, for investment subsidies. Uh, their market stays rather small. In India, they say it's related to technology and reliability uh, questions. So the systems do not perform the way they should. So this is an issue there. Um, Actually, I'm, I, I would really like to have this uh, once a bit of budget to go more in detail about this question, how to uh, subsidize markets in a professional way and bring them up, ship markets. But I haven't really had subsidies yet on this, so it's still an open question. Um, the, the second part, awareness, is a really, really crucial one. And I think that we need biggest efforts um, in bringing these industrial clients to any kind of awareness regarding their heat consumption. I think that is a, a big effort which our sector alone cannot really tackle and we have seen that in the past and I'm really a fan of you know having a certain obligation or a certain you know frame conditions that make companies aware um, of you have to do something for your heat demand and then they talk to us, you know, otherwise or talk to renewable heat uh, people but because otherwise um, they have so many other problems and they have water and they have competition and they have resources and they have whatever, uh, their heat demand is a very small issue. So I think that um, this needs some some thinking, you know, and we have seen that in countries where subsidy, um, energy subsidies are announced to be removed, also in the industry or are already removed, a lot of uh, demand comes up from the industry or you do it more drastically like in, in China where you just cut the, the uh, steam supply down in the steam networks in industrial areas if there's air, too much air pollution so companies have to to reduce their production if they have no ship plant so you you all these function well but uh, besides that um, you know awareness is is a very crucial and and really 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 big effort and really big um, issue for our sector and um, related to these um, do the, one of the questions is what uh, are the offers there that could be similar to power purchase agreements or as someone was putting heat purchase agreements that will be uh, in terms of kilowatt uh, thermal yes well absolutely i think only we have again the same issue a power purchase agreement is already a standardized contract which exists maybe 10000 times worldwide you know between an utility and a company or whatever in all ways and and heat uh, purchase contracts are not yet standardized so and they are a bit more complicated as well because you don't have a big grid on the other side but you have a demand structure of the client so you have to do in your contract certain arrangements on if the heat supply structure of your client is changing what uh, do you do as compensation and all that so I think what I learned from the ESCOs out there is that we need uh, discussions about standardized heat purchase agreements that are agreed by either structures like IEA tasks you know or worked on at in association levels or agreed with with certain industry associations like end consumer industry associations like the paper industry decides with the heat suppliers on a certain contract I think this would be a good vehicle to to bring everybody online and to bring everybody in a kind of agreement that that the purchase a heat purchase must look like this and is from the law structure done in this way so that would be a, a very important next step. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much. I don't know if we have uh, um, Vernon and Thomas uh, back with us, so just trying to um, double check. Um, but we um, we are also uh, reaching the the limit uh, of our time, or we have already reached the limit of our time. Um, regarding uh, the many questions we have received and some of them uh, very interesting that we we could uh, uh, that uh, I would be happy that we could have uh, addressed uh, and namely uh, PVT I think that was uh, one of the areas that really uh, brought up the curiosity of the participants um, we uh, uh, will uh, coordinate with the uh, with the secretariat uh, and also with the with the panelists to try to address uh, as much as possible 
uh, the questions that you have brought uh, up. So thank you very much for uh, your participation. So this said, um, I think we uh, um, will be bring back, uh, uh, bring this to a closing. So I would like to um, thank you, Arabella, and and uh, give her back the floor. And, and again, thank you for all the the work and preparation for for this webinar. Thank you very much, Pedro, and thank you very much to all of our speakers. I'm a bit afraid we lost uh, Rana and Thomas in the last few minutes, um, but as Pedro already mentioned, we will certainly forward all of the questions we received to them as well, and then they will have the chance to get back to you on your questions. So for now, before we end the webinar, there are a few more quick things I'd like to say. And the first one is that in November 2019, ISIS and the IEA HSC are going to have a very exciting event that's coming up, and that is the Solar World Congress together with the International Conference on Solar Heating and Cooling for Buildings in the Industry, so just the topic we covered in today's webinar. Um, and this event will consist of plenary speeches, presentations, forums, workshops, social events, technical tours, and more. And within the event, we will also feature the ninth International Conference on Solar Air Conditioning, that is the SAC 2019, and also the 13th International Symposium on Renewable Energy Education, the ISRI 2019. So we very much invite you to visit the homepages for the Solar World Congress 2019. As you can see, that's svcw2019.org uh, and the shc2019.org. The registration is now open for um, this joint event. The hotel accommodation is recommended. Um, many more information can be found on the homepage. So we are very much looking forward to seeing many of you there. And then for my closing words for today, I know that many of you are going to be very interested in, in, to see the webinar recording and also have a chance to have a more detailed look at the webinar presentations. So the recording as well as the presentations, they will be available on both the ISIS and the IEA HSC homepage within one today. Two, two days after this webinar. And for our ISIS members, please remember you already have unlimited access to all past webinars and all the past presentations once you are logged in on the homepage. And so for today, I'd like to thank you once again to all of our speakers and Pedro, our moderator. Thank you very much to you, the audience. Um, we always prepare a quick survey that will be distributed to you after the webinar. And we are looking forward to your feedback because this really helps us to produce the webinars you really want to see. So we very much invite you to complete the survey. And also, you can always write to us at public.relations.iss.org. And with that, I'd like to say thank you once again. And we are now going to end the webinar. And we wish you a really nice day wherever you are around the world. Goodbye. <laughs>